you so very much for tuning in here today at Church on the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusOfTheRock.org. There you can find out all sorts of information on our ministries, or you can give to our church financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us, and welcome to Church on the Rock. I came to share with you this morning a sermon that I've titled, And We Know. And We Know. You got to love it when technology works. You know, for some time now, I've, I've felt this Holy Spirit push that in my walk with God, I've, I feel like I've learned certain things, just like you have, that have made my walk easier and made my walk with God stronger. And, and I feel like God is saying, share these things. Somehow, some way, there's always a way to share, but... In short, I feel like the Lord has said, give and share with others what I've given to you. Well, I gave away all my money yesterday, so for you this morning, all I have is words, okay? So I told someone the other day, you know, when we share what we've learned in our walk with God, it's sort of similar to swapping recipes. Now, some of us do that. You know, what good is it if you have a great recipe, Pat, for barbecue ribs, if you never share it with anybody, what good is it unless you invite us all over to eat? But yet when you give that away, then everyone gets to enjoy it, amen? So this morning, I just feel like I want to pass on to you what I believe is a great recipe for growing your faith. It's something I've learned, and it's worked for me, and and if I share it with you, maybe it'll work for you. Now, many of you have endured my presence at this podium before, and, and, and when you've done that, um, you know, I like to talk in the form of stories, and so this will be no different, so let me just jump right in. Um, quick background on my childhood. I mean, I had two wonderful parents, a mother and a father, and I was the youngest of seven kids. I had five sisters, one brother. Um, Five sisters taught me how to get in touch with my feminine side. Um, Neither of my parents were Christians. And when I say they weren't Christians, they weren't even occasional churchgoers. Never in the first 20 years of my life did I ever know my parents to go to church, nor require me to go to church. So it just didn't happen. Um, So I had zero teaching of any kind of biblical sense at all, the first 20 years of my life, none. My father was a retired lieutenant colonel from the Army. He was one of these guys. He was full of confidence and came across to most as arrogant, pretty cocky, Um, but he was pretty optimistic about life and about opportunities that came along. He did have that. My mother, she was much different. She was a very loving, caring, loyal person. And she spent most of her entire life as a servant taking care of my father and raising seven children. But she, on the other hand, was very pessimistic about life. Oh, you can't do that. You can't do this. That's not going to work. How I would turn out (laughs) with no Christ in my life and them as my parents was going to be anybody's guess. Now, From the time I was about nine years old, my whole life was focused and driven by sports. That's that's what I had. That's that's what I went to. Uh, I found out early that I loved and enjoyed all types of athletic competition. And and part of this story evolves around what I'm fixing to tell you. One night I was pitching in a baseball game. I was a pitcher. And I was pitching in this game, and... We were winning this game 4-0, to and it was the last inning. There was two outs. I'm still pitching, and up until that moment, I was pitching flawlessly. Just everything was going my way, but then something happened. I don't know what it was, but something happened. Something changed that, and all of a sudden, I couldn't throw a strike to save my life. In fact, it became so bad that I walked the bases loaded. I hope Some of you understand that. I don't have time to explain what that means. 
I walked the bases loaded, and then it got even worse, and I walked in the next three batters. So now we're in the bottom of that inning, two outs, and now the game is four to three. Well, I'm freaking out. I'm out there thinking, man, what is going on? I keep looking over to the bench where my coach was at, and he's just sort of pacing. And then finally we make eye contact, and I'm like screaming, please. And he comes out there, and he says, what's going on, Maurice? And I said, I don't, I don't know, coach, but uh, all I know is I can't throw a strike. And I said, you better pull me out of here. I'm going to lose this game for us. And I couldn't even put a period behind that sentence when he said, I'm not pulling you out of this game. You're going to finish it out. You're going to win it on your own. And he said it with authority. And I kind of stood back and I said, Coach, I don't think I can do this. And before I could even say another word, he said, stop talking. No negative talk. Stop talking. And so I'm standing out there on this pitcher's mound. The rest of the team behind me, all these people in the stands watching me, And he decides he's going to take me through this exercise that I've never done before. Now, I'm 17 years old. But you might say that he led me in my first repeat after me faith prayer. He said, all right, here's what I want you to do. Look me in the eye. Look me in the eye. And I want you to say this out loud, repeat it after me. I said, I don't, you know, I was, I was already an embarrassed 17-year-old that had just walked in, three runs, the bases were loaded. Come on, coach. He said, look me in the eye and say this out loud. I know that I have pitched excellent all night tonight. Right now, I know that I can throw strikes and win this game. I will throw strikes because I know that I can. And he made me say this three times. True story. He walked off back to the dugout. The next batter came to the plate. I threw three pitches, struck him out, and the game was over. And I was just amazed at what had happened. I mean, what was it that changed that moment in my life that night? I mean, I was a mess just moments before that. I mean, did I change my technique of throwing? Did I position myself different on the mound? Did I just get lucky and finally get a weak hitter that couldn't swing at anything? No. What I got was a lesson that taught me that there is power in the words we speak. Amen? Do you know that? Do you ever think about what comes out of your mouth? Do you know that there is power in the words you speak? Now, if there was anything spiritual about that moment, I didn't recognize it because remember my background. I wouldn't have known a spiritual moment if it had happened. I wouldn't have recognized it. But here is what I do remember. I remember... After the third time that I said that, I felt this incredible urge of power just come into me as I was speaking these words out loud. They're coming out of my mouth and going back in my ears. And when I repeated them, all of a sudden, all doubt was gone, and I just knew I could do it. Have you ever had that happen? I didn't understand it. I just knew it worked. And I have used this technique from that day in every area of my life. Now, I may have to go get in my truck to scream out loud what I want to scream. I may have to go find my prayer closet, but you better believe the technique works. So maybe you're wondering, well, is this really what we, you know, we came to hear from the pulpit? Well, I think it is, and I'm going to tell you why. Because you see, about three years later in my life, I was now 20 years old, and I said yes to salvation. God found me at the age of 20, and I began my walk, and I'm going to tell you, man, what a journey it was. It was hard. I mean, my early years where God were so tough, and I struggled so bad. And I'm sure that I tried to run from God on numerous, numerous occasions, but he just kept going out there and finding me 
and bringing me back. And then in 1978, God brought a man into my life. A man that would ultimately change my world. He was arrogant, he was cocky, he was confident, and he was my new pastor. This man sort of reminded me of my heavenly father, but this man became my spiritual mentor. This man was able to not only give me what my earthly father gave me, but to be able to spiritually teach me things. So at the young age of 23, I became a student of his in learning how to walk in the kingdom of God. I mean, he first taught me how to become what he believed to be a man of God. Then he taught me later how to look for a godly, loyal wife. He educated me on God's word, and he taught me how to listen for the Holy Spirit so that I might be led at all times, in the proper direction. Now, these teachings, they came with a lot of anguish because I was still young. I was still very immature, and I just couldn't grasp this thing called faith. Anybody have a problem sometimes with faith? I kicked, I screamed almost every time that I would face trials and tribulations. And and it was because I just didn't understand why why I had to suffer when I said yes to Jesus. Has anybody ever thought that? I mean, yes, I believe. I'm saved. Why am I suffering? I had absolutely no problem in saying I believed in God. I just had a problem in trusting when hardship came my way. And I had a hard time understanding how this was supposed to make me better and stronger. And of course, while all of that's going on, all of my non-Christian friends around me, you know, they were prospering, enjoying the many things of this world that I wasn't. I was struggling. So it was during those difficult days of trying to remain the faithful student that I noticed every time I would call my pastor for counsel, and buddy, I had him on speed dial before cell phones ever knew anything, and I would call him just to cry or whine or scream about something, and he would patiently listen to my complaints, and then invariably, his first words would always be this. Maurice, and we know. And we know. Even if he didn't have an answer, or maybe he just didn't even know what to say, he would always say this first, and we know. (laughs) When I look back on it now, I'm sure he must have told me that those three words were the beginning of Romans 8.28. But I must have heard him say that multiple times before finally one day when I called him whining about something, I finally said, why do you always say that? And so, with great patience, he opened his Bible and we turned to Romans 8.28. And he said, we're going to read it out loud together. How does it start? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. He went on to explain to me that sometimes we just experience these and we know moments. Have you ever had an and we know moment where you just 
Why is this happening to me? Why did I just lose my job? Why did he get hired instead of me? I'm sure he gave me a great explanation for it. But in my New Living Translation, and if any of you have that, one day you need to open that and go back to it, but it gives this incredible description of Romans 8.28 in the footnotes. And I hate to read stuff to you like that, but if you, but I'm going to, and if you get this, if you get this, I'm telling you it's going to turn your world around. And here's what it says. The footnote for Romans 8.28 in the NLT Bible. God works in everything, not just isolated incidents for our good. God works in everything for our good. This does not mean that all that happens to us is good. We don't have to say that everything that happens to us is good. We just need to know that God's working for our good. Evil is prevalent to our fallen world. But God is able to turn every circumstance around for our long-range good. Maybe it's not today, but maybe it's for your long-range good. But God's going to turn it around. Note, God is not working to make us happy, but to fulfill His purpose. That's very important. Note also that this promise is not for everybody. It can be claimed only by those who love God and are called by him. That is, those whom the Holy Spirit convinces to receive Christ. We have to be saved. We can say we love God. We have to be saved to receive this promise. Get that. And if we are, it goes on to say, such people have a new perspective, have a new mindset. They trust in God, not in their worldly treasures. Their security is in heaven not on earth. Their faith in God does not waver in pain and persecution because they know God is with them. They know God is with them. Now, church, I'm not going to tell you that just because my pastor and I read that scripture together out loud that I instantly gained perfect understanding of it because I didn't. And you may be sitting out there saying the same thing right now. That's a lot of words. That's a lot of verbiage. You have to sit and sort of meditate on this. But stay with me because here is what he showed me about that scripture that happened to be the most important part of it. You know, many of us, many of you, if I were to say, what does Romans 8.28 say? Most people would say, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. All things work good for our good. I, got a pl- I bought a plaque that I've got. I mean, I'm so, this scripture just drives my life. And I got this plaque in, in Romans 8, 28, and it hangs over a door. And do you know it says, all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord? But here's my point. The first three words of the Scripture are the most important. Does that make any sense? It starts off how? And we know. Do we know? (laughs) Do we know? What does it mean when we say, I know? Well, it's supposed to mean that it's just irrefutable. It's just beyond any doubt. We know it is true. So if we know it is true, then why don't we act like it's true? Why are we still screaming, why, God? Why does this happen to me? I tithe. 
I do this, I do that. I mean, I cut the grass at the church last week. Why? Things we don't like. The answer is simple. We still don't believe it. We still don't believe it. So what can we do? What can we do to help us move closer to believing, trusting, growing our faith in God? That's why I'm here. Here comes my recipe. Here's what I came to share with you. If you don't get anything else, if you don't get anything else out of anything I've said this morning, get this. This pastor, spiritual mentor, man that changed my life, he taught me that if every time, every time that I fell into doubt, fell into worry, had questions, had concerns, had anxiety, had anger issues, and wanted to scream, why God? To first pause and then out loud speak these words, and we know. And we know. I don't like this, what's going on. And we know. Say it with me. And we know. And we know. You see, when we verbalize things out loud, again, it comes out of our mouth, goes back in our ears. When we do that, you know what we're doing? We're creating a belief seed. A belief seed that goes back in and plants itself in our hearts. And it will remind you of all those promises that we read a while ago in Romans 8, 28. Now, I don't have time. You'll have to go back and read the promises for yourself. You see, even studies have shown that the more we personally verbalize something out loud, the stronger our belief is that it's true or that it's going to become true. I go back to my high school baseball game. I didn't even know what I was doing, but it worked. Now, with the knowledge I have of walking with God, so you ask yourself these questions, is this just a bunch of motivational bunk, or can we really biblically back this up. Well, you know, if you get into the scriptures and you can research this for yourself, there's a lot of biblical truth to what I'm giving you here. I mean, Proverbs 18.21 tells us death and life are what? In the power of our tongue. What are you saying about your life? What are you saying about your situation? Matthew 21.22 says, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Go back to Genesis 1, the first chapter. And God said, let there be light, let there be water, let there be a parting. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, truly I say unto you, whoever says to this mountain, Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. And then Joel three ten, let the weak say, I am strong. I was weak, very weak, so many times in my life. But when I would say, and we know, those promises would come alive in me that were planted. And I would begin to remember it. And I, did, had, I had, could quit explaining it. I didn't have to know why. I just had to know that what Romans 8, 28 is what God's doing in my life. So I put this practice, I put this into practice in my ball game. But now, after walking with God for 40 years, I use it in every trial and tribulation I face to this moment. And I got to tell you, I don't think my trials and tribulations are as frequent now. Now, I'm not telling you I don't have any. I'm just saying they're not as frequent. And I believe there's three reasons why. Because every time, number one, every time I face it, this is the first thing I say. 
and we know. So I kind of remind myself that even though this situation is disturbing to me and I don't like it, I know God's in it for my good. Amen? Number two, I think after 40 years, I believe God has seen the inner depths of my heart. I believe God now knows my faithfulness. God knows my belief in him. Number three, I think Satan would rather go after an easier catch. He doesn't go fishing for me as frequently now because he too knows my heart. You get that? Satan knows everything. Come on. He knows everything God knows about you. But he too knows my heart. So he also knows where I stand in faith and where I believe in God. Bottom line, the strong kids usually don't get bullied at school. Amen? They just don't. Who gets bullied? Typically, it's the weak. We need to get strong in believing, and we know. Let me close with this. And I don't know if we even still have a worship team here, do we? We're going to operate under the belief that maybe they're not here. (laughs) If you and I are going to love, if we're going to follow this great commandment that Jesus gave, and what did it say? Love the Lord with all your heart, all your strength, and all your soul. And then on top of that, love your neighbor, then we better believe that in order to do this, we need to develop a faith level and a trust level in God that is so strong it can stand against anything that comes our way. Now, I say most anything because I'm still breathing. Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. Now, if this message blessed you in any way, let us hear about it. You can email pray at jesusoftherock.org, or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. Now, I pray that God shows you awesome ways to apply this message to your everyday life.